We're continuing our study on the book of Titus. Yeah. That sounds a little dog. Yeah. Uh, and today we're looking at the Christian responsibility in society. Well, before we get into that, let's do a little recap. Two weeks ago in the book of Titus, chapter 2, verses 11 through 15, the Apostle Paul wanted to reinforce the central reality that the sovereign purpose of all exhortations to holy living in Scripture is to honor and glorify God through the righteous living of His people. That leading to the salvation of more sinners. Therefore, he, uh, Paul culminated practical instruction with a monumental section about the saving work of God and condensed the eternal plan of God in Christ by grace. He gave four aspects or realities of God's redemptive grace. Number one, salvation from the penalty of sin. Number two, salvation from the power of sin. Number three, salvation from the presence of sin. And number four, salvation from the possession of sin. And then last, in verse 15, Paul ended chapter 2 by exhorting Titus to teach and preach God's word with authority. Now today, in the book of Titus, chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, we won't get there, all the way through there, but the Apostle Paul moves from how, he, how believers ought to live in the church, and he talked about that in chapter 2, to how they are to live in society. In the first eight verses of chapter 3, Paul admonishes Titus to remind Christians, especially on the island of Crete, of realities they had made or heard many times before. The four major areas of remembrance that he's going to be talking about are, number one, pertain to our duties as Christians. We'll see that in verses one and two. And then number two, to our former condition of unbelief and sin. And then number three, to our salvation through Jesus Christ, verses four through seven. And then number four, to our mission to an unbelieving lost world in verse eight. But as I began to study this out, uh, since it all goes together, I thought, well, I'll just do verses 1 through 8. Well, I got going, and there was just too much information. I thought, I'm going to do this in two messages. So today, we're just looking at verses 1 through 3. And so we are looking at here. And so to begin with, in verses 1 and 2, Paul exhorts Titus to remind believers of their duties in society. He declares, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey to be ready for every good work. Then verse 2, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. Well, first, Paul says, remind them. Well, the term remind means suggest to the memory, put in mind, or bring to remembrance. This verb is an imperative, a command, that applies to all of the admonitions in this passage. The present tense gives the verb the additional connotations of continuity and persistence, something that we're supposed to continually, habitually practice. Reminding Christians of these truths should keep them from feeling hostile toward and superior to the unconverted or the unsaved around us. Next, Paul gives seven Christian duties that apply to all believers at all times. They are the attitudes and dispositions that should always characterize our lives among those who do not belong to God. <coughs> well, the Holy Spirit here defines our obligation to pagan culture, which we live in. Amen? We live in a pagan culture. You know, if you went back into the, you know, the 50s and, and around there, you could actually say that America looked like a Christian culture. But not anymore. No, that's all gone in the past. It's a pagan culture. And so, willing obedience to human authority demonstrates to the world that the ways and workings of this world are not to be major concerns for believers. You see, our work is in this world, but not of it. Because our true citizenship is in heaven, according to Philippians 3.20. Our focus is to be on holy living and our winning the lost to Jesus Christ, 
who himself came to seek and to save that which is lost, according to Luke 19.10. That's God's heart. God's heart is saving the lost. Where's your heart at? How often do we think about lost people? When you go to work, do you think about lost people that you work with? Your neighbors, do you pray for your neighbors by name? Do you, when you go to the store, do you think about giving tracts to people that are lost? See, God has a heart for the lost. We should also have a heart for the lost. Amen? We should. I mean, that should be on our hearts continually, all the time, about lost people and what can I personally do to reach the lost. In obedience to the Lord and as a testimony to the world, we are to not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds that we may prove what is that, what is that God's will that is good, acceptable, and perfect, according to Romans 12, 2. You see, people are watching, and God wants us to be a good example to the world. As Christians, we are a chosen generation, a royal priest of the holy nation, his own special people, that we may proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous life. 1 Peter 2, 9. I always love that verse. It just, to me, it's just amazing. I said, you know, how it, he called us, he brought us out of darkness, and he brought us into his, not just light, but his marvelous light. I love that. And truly it is. It is marvelous. Amen? God's light is marvelous. It changes us from the inside out and it gives us the eternal perspective. And, and we know that if something happens, we're going to be with Him in heaven. And we have to promise all His promises are yea, not nay. And so, man, we, we have lot to be excited about. It is for that reason that we are to keep our behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander us as evildoers, they may, on account of our good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Paul talks about this in, in uh, chapter 2 and verse 12. The first Christian duty that he mentions here for believers is to be subject to rulers and authorities. Well, this duty pertains to our attitude and conduct in regard to secular government. Well, that's difficult sometimes, isn't it? It is important to note that Paul specifies no particular kind or level of government or any particular kind or level of government official. He allows for no exception or qualification. So in other words, it's for all, no matter where they're at, what, uh, what they might, uh, their, their job might be, it is for all rulers and authorities. In Romans 13, Paul mentions seven reasons why all people, including believers, are under divine obligation to respect and obey human government. First, the governing authorities which exist are established by God, he said, verse 1. Second, the person who resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, verse 2a. Third, those who oppose such authority will receive condemnation upon themselves, verse 2b. Number four, government is designed to restrain evil and is therefore not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. See that in verse three. Number five, it is divinely designed to promote the good of individuals and of society, a minister of God to you for good. We would see that in chapter 13 of Romans, chapter and verse four. Number six, and conversely, it also is divinely empowered to punish wrongdoers, if necessary, by capital punishment, by capital punishment, meaning the sword, as an avenger who brings wrath upon the one who practices evil. Verse 4 B. Number 7. For believers, it is necessary to be in subjection to government, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. <coughs> For because of this, you also pay taxes, the apostle continues, he says, for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all that is due them, tax to whom taxes due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Verses 6 and 7 of Romans 13. And so Paul makes it very clear how we are supposed to be subject to rulers and authorities. The Roman government under which the early church lived not only was 
thoroughly pagan and morally debauched, but also was despondent, oppressive, unjust, and brutal. Nevertheless, Paul makes clear that the Christian's obligation to respect and obey human government does not rest on it, its being democratic or just, but solely on it being the God-ordained means by which human society is regulated. Therefore, as Paul makes clear in the passage just cited, the person who resists and opposes human government really resists and opposes God. Wow. Well, the second Christian duty is we are to obey human authorities. The only exception regards their commanding us to do something that is against the command of God as stated in Scripture. Amen? When that is the case, then we can say, you know, I, I, I'm sorry I can't do that uh, because it goes against what God says in, in His Word. Well, such an exception is found in the account of Acts 4 when the Sanhedrin, the Jewish high council in Jerusalem, ordered Peter and John not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. The apostles replied, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be judged. For we cannot stop speaking what we have seen and heard. Acts 4, 18-20. The third Christian duty, we are to be ready for every good work. So what does that mean? Well, Paul is not speaking of reluctantly doing what we know we should do in society, but of willingly and sincerely being ready and prepared to perform every good work toward people around us that we have opportunity to do. He is referring to a sincere, loving eagerness to serve others. No matter how hostile the society around us may be, we are to be good to the people in it whose lives intersect with ours. While we have opportunity, the Bible says, we are to do good to all men, and especially to those who are of the household of faith, Galatians 6.10. We are to be known for what might be described as a consistent, aggressive goodness, done not simply out of duty, but out of love for our Lord and for other people. Everything we do every day, we need to consider you know, is this going to be pleasing to God, right? What would Jesus do? Is this pleasing to God? If everything we think, do, and say, we should ask that question. That attitude is in direct contrast to that of false teachers. As Paul mentions earlier in this letter, such men profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny Him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. Titus 1.16 talks about that. The lives of believers should continually demonstrate the spiritual transformation they have received through faith in Jesus Christ. Can your co-workers tell a difference in you? Uh, can your neighbors tell a difference in you? Can your family tell a difference in you? Are, are you, do, are, do you? Is it clear that you belong to God? Uh, could you be convicted in a court of being a Christian? Or a Christ follower. The fourth Christian duty, we are to speak evil of no one. The Greek word for the phrase here, to speak evil of, is from which we get the English word blasphemy. This word means to revile, to malign, or hurt with the reputation, hurt the reputation of someone. It is to slander, curse, and treat with contempt, and it can never be done from a righteous motive. i got to tell you that as I was studying this out, God convicted my heart of this very thing right here. To speak evil of no one. Because you can ask my wife, when we watch TV, and these politicians do not care. It gets me upset. And sometimes I say things about them. No, I don't curse, but I just say things, negative things about them. And God convicted my heart of that. Mm. Uh, something to think about. <laughs> we should speak evil of no one. Oh, okay. Not even those who contribute most to the assault on biblical standards. 
even while contending against the worst of sins committed by the worst of sinners, we must never stoop to maligning those whose sin we detest. It is tragic that many Christians speak contemptuously of politicians here for this guy, this is where got me, and other public figures, not realizing that in doing so they hinder the work of redemption. Paul admonishes, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions, and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, in order that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. <coughs> Instead of focusing on what we disagree with them about, we should be thinking about their soul. Right? We really should. Um, what, what we do is we focus on um, that person and, and their sin, what they do and say upsets us, so we malign them. We really, uh, it's okay to be angry at sin, but it's not okay to be evil people. And so we've got to be very careful, don't we? We've got to be careful what we say about everyone. Fifth Christian duty. We are to be peaceable. The Greek term for the phrase be peaceable means not a brawler, uncontentious, and refers to being friendly and peaceful toward the lost rather than quarrelsome and belligerent. And in an ungodly, immoral society, it is easy to become angry with those who corrupt it, condemning them and writing them off as hopeless and beyond the pale of God's grace. And that's what we do sometimes. We look at people, and there's some people, I'm telling you, I, I can see the pictures in my, their faces in my mind of politicians in our, our country that I'm telling you, oh my goodness, they get under my skin. Uh, but I'm telling you, they, they need saved. They need a Savior. That's what we should be praying for them, that God would convict their heart, pour out His Spirit upon them, and save them. And only God can change their heart, right? We can't change their heart. Only God can do that. And so, but we have no right to become hostile when unbelievers act like unbelievers. If possible, Paul admonished believers in Rome, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Romans 12, 18. If God so limitlessly and unconditionally loved the world that He sent His sinless Son to redeem it, how can we, as sinful recipients of His redeeming grace, be callous and loveless for those who have not yet received it? Yet we lose sight about a person's soul and we get upset about what they're simply doing. Sixth Christian duty. We are to be gentle. <coughs> the term gentle carries the basic idea of that which is moderate, mild, fair, patient, and forbearing in regard to treatment of others. It has been referred to as a sweet reasonableness. An attitude that does not keep a list of the wrongs done to him. I've told you this before, but it's interesting to me. Uh, years ago, I was listening to some counseling session. And this one guy said that this, uh, he was doing one counseling, this marriage counseling, and he said uh, he was looking at the, the people, and he, you know, the, the husband and wife, and he was asking questions. And he said, all of a sudden, this the, the wife she brought up this paper out of her purse, and, and she she had written down things that her husband had done for a lap did for the last 20 years. She kept track of all the bad he did for the last 20 years. <laughs> that guy's like, you know, his mouth goes, what? Yeah, we're not to keep records of their wrong, right? Sometimes we do that. It, it's hard to forget, right? We are not to keep records of their wrong. Or hold grudges. Have we ever held grudges? Huh? We're not hold grudges, but always give others the benefit of the doubt. This term is used in 1 Timothy 3, 3, describing the qualification of an elder or pastor. He must be gentle. 
Number seven is the Christian duty. We are to be showing all humility to all men, or all people, you would say. This is a characteristic closely related to the previous two. In Greek literature, the term for humility was sometimes used of a feigned hypocritical concern for others that is motivated by self-interest. But in the New Testament, it is always used of genuine humility or consideration for others and is sometimes translated in this verse as meekness. So we are to show humility to all people. Our Lord himself is the supreme example of showing genuine humility to all men that should characterize us as his followers. In his second letter to believers in Corinth, Paul speaks of the meekness and gentleness of Christ in 2 Corinthians 10.1. In, he, in a gracious appeal to his followers, Jesus used the same adjective of himself, saying, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle, there's the word, and lowly in heart, that you may find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Matthew 11, 28-30. Our attitude toward unbelievers should always reflect a spirit of humility, of meekness and gentleness. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, Paul says in 1 Peter 3.15. We also are to deal with sinful and disobedient fellow believers in a spirit of gentleness. Galatians 6 1. With gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. 2 Timothy 2 25. The phrase all men or all people is not an exaggeration. Paul is speaking of every human being particularly the unsaved. Three times in his first letter to Timothy, the apostle urges that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of things be made for all men. Again, all people. He reminds us that God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth and is the Savior of all a man, especially of those who believe. Earlier in this letter to Titus, he rejoices that the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men. Genuine heartfelt humility or consideration for all men is one of the most foundational spiritual virtues. As followers and imitators of Jesus Christ, our calling is not to fight for our rights or privileges against the ungodly. Rather, as we live in this corrupt world in subjection, obedience, and to human authority, doing good works, speaking evil of no one, and being peaceable, gentle, and humble, we will thereby demonstrate the gracious power of God to transform sinners and make them like himself. You see, the only Jesus that people might see is who? You. Yeah. And so we want to be able to represent him in a way that's honoring to him. Next, in verse 3, Paul calls on believers to remember their former condition of unbelief and sin. Sometimes we, you know, as Christians, we get a big head and think, you know, we're so good, we're so, you know, we're so, we're better than them. You know? No, we're, we're just one, uh, you know, uh, act or choice of way. We could be the same way. We could be in that gutter. We could be a drug addict. We could be an alcoholic. We could be any of those things. It wasn't for the grace of God. Amen? It's by God's grace that we're not there. And so he says in verse 3, Paul says, For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Rather than resent and slandering unbelieving leaders, educators, and the media, and people in the entertainment industry, and rather than becoming incensed and venomous in our attacks on the immoral 
agendas of various organizations and movements, we should rather we should re remember that we were also once like those whom we now are inclined to be fame and condemn. We were once like them and would still be like them if it were not for the saving grace of God, which alone delivered us. Amen. As we grow in the things of the Lord, it is difficult to be engaged at the unbelieving rapid growth. I mean, we, we say that. It is difficult not to be enraged at the unbelievable rapid growth and acceptance of such things as homosexuality, pornography, transgenderism, New Age philosophy, abortion pills, drag queen story time for children, and school sex education that promotes almost everything but chastity. Those and many other such beliefs and practices are unquestionably evil, corrupt, destructive, and ungodly. They ravage individual lives and society as a whole, and they dishonor our holy God. Amen? Amen. They do. That's the society we're living in. It's not a pretty picture. In order for us as believers to give a godly testimony in a pagan culture, we must remember that such is to be expected from the ungodly. In our former condition, that is, before we were regenerated, reborn, born again, we are ourselves were also once foolish, Paul says. Just like the unbelievers among whom we now live and witness and by whom we are so agitated by sometimes. To reinforce his point, Paul lists seven vices that characterize the unsaved. Vices in which we ourselves were once engaged. First, Paul reminds us that we were foolish. Well, the term foolish denotes complete lack of understanding, total ignorance in regard to a particular area of knowledge. Paul's point here is that no matter how advanced a person's education and intellectual accomplishments may be, if he does not recognize God and trust in Him for deliverance from sin, he is foolish. For well, the fool says there is no God, amen? That's what Proverbs says. He is foolish concerning the most important truth regarding himself. With God, even the wisdom of man is foolishness. Second, we should be patient and gracious to the unsaved of our society because we too were once by nature disobedient to all authority <coughs> by God. Through Jeremiah, the Lord revealed that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jeremiah 79. The world says, follow your heart. Oh, just do whatever feels right. It's going to be okay. No, the Bible says our hearts are de deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. No, don't follow your heart. Follow God. Follow the Word of God. Follow His Spirit. Amen? Jesus declared that out of the heart come evil thoughts, murderers, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders, and everything else that defiles a man. Matthew 15, 19 and 20. Only God can change the heart of man. Number three. As believers, we were once by our very nature deceived. The term deceived has a basic idea of being purposely led astray. Satan's objective is to lead sinners into a greater sin and ungodliness. John refers to him as the great dragon who was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. Revelation 12, 9. Reflecting the nature and following the example of their spiritual father, the devil, evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, according to 2 Timothy 3.13. And we can see that, and we can see that in our culture today. We see it happening all around us. People are being deceived. They think they're totally right. They think they, they have reality. They're so far from reality of being right, they have no clue. But they are being deceived. Fourth, 
As believers, we were once by our very nature serving various lusts and pleasures. Although the unsaved natural man willfully chooses to sin, he does so because his very constitution is sinful, and he has neither desire nor the ability to do anything but sinful, but be sinful. He is therefore both willingly and inevitably serving or enslaved to sin in its many and various forms. The term lust refers to the active and individual sinful desires. The Greek word for the term pleasures is from which we get the English word hedonism. The insatiable pursuit of self-satisfaction that so characterizes modern society today. Whether the particular lust and pleasures involve misuse of good things that the Lord provides or are intrinsically evil, the natural man desires and enjoys them for purely selfish and sinful reasons. We were like that. Number five. Before we were converted, we were once by our very nature living in malice. The present active participle living carries the further idea of a normal, typical manner of life and is therefore rendered as spending our life. The term malice means wickedness or evil. And as one Greek scholar refers to it, he said, the vicious character generally. To varying degrees, but inevitably, the unsaved person spends his life maliciously. Number six, as unbelievers, we were once by our very nature living in envy. The term envy is a sin that carries its own reward. It guarantees its own frustration and disappointment. By definition, the envious person cannot be satisfied with what he has and will always crave for more. His evil desires and pleasures are insatiable, and he cannot abide, uh, abide any other person having something he doesn't have or having more of something than he has himself. Number seven. Before we were regenerated, we were once by our very nature hateful and hating one another. Hate is a natural fruit of envy. But it is also produced by many other things, especially selfishness, which is pride. It often has no rational base and simply is expressed for its own sake. It does not need a reason. You see, hateful persons despise anyone and anything that stands in their way or displeases them. They find themselves hating one another, Paul says, and eventually hating everyone, including those who are most like them. Hatred is not a human <coughs> sin even to the hateful. You see, blind to God's truth, God's standards, God's will, and all spiritual reality unbelievers generate exactly the kind of world that is ours today. Amen? That's what we see. It shouldn't surprise us. Well, it bothers us, and it shouldn't bother us with all the sin and, and the perversion and garbage that's going on around us. It should bother us, but it shouldn't surprise us because the Bible tells us this is going to happen in the last days. They can do nothing else, but although we despise the sins that characterize, motivate, and drive them, we must constantly keep in mind Paul's point in this verse. All of us, without exception, were ourselves once characterized, motivated, and driven by the same sins that are repulsive to us now. That awareness should humble us and be a cause is to be on guard against hating those who are sinful and who need salvation through Jesus Christ, just as we did. We need to be concerned about people, people's souls. That's what we should be thinking about. They need Jesus. Why are they acting like that? Because they're lost. They belong to Satan. They are his child. That's why they're acting like that. They need Jesus. And so we need to take them before the throne of God. We need to pray for them continually. Amen? Mm -hmm. That's what we need to do. And as often as we can, we need to do good.
good to them. Bible says even do good to your enemies. You know, and pray for them and, and, and do good things for them. And, and so uh, we should do that. We should uh, show the love of Jesus to those around us that are living in a perverted way. That doesn't mean that we tell them we agree with their perverted actions. No, no. We make that clear we don't agree with that. But we're going to love you anyway. Well, we're going to love you anyway. Just like Jesus loved me before I loved him. And when I was sinning, we need to love them. And so we need to be concerned about their soul. You see, we must look at the unsaved as our Lord looked at them during his incarnation, and he still looks at them now. Well, how is that? With grief and tears over their lostness, and a compassionate desire to see them repent, believe in Jesus Christ, and be saved. Do you have a desire in your heart to belong to? Do you have a burden for the lost? Well, Paul here is calling us <clears throat> to, first of all, to take a look at ourselves and our behavior as believers, as Christians, to this lost world and make sure that we're not behaving in such a way that brings dishonor to our Lord and Savior. That's the first thing we need to do. And like I shared with you, my heart was convicted when I was putting this together and where it said, speak evil of no one. I have done that. I find it easy to do that when I'm watching TV. <laughs> now, I, you understand what I'm saying, right? You, are you there with me? <laughs> Does that make it right? No. Just because it feels good and, you know, it's something you, you know, you, oh, I'm, I'm giving them the truth. You know. No. It says, speak evil of no one. Wow. That's difficult. Right? That's very, very difficult. I think we've got to learn to talk about the sin and not the person. Right? I think we need to learn how to do that. I, I'm going to try to do that myself, right? After this message, can make me mark. But I'm going to learn how to like, think about the sin and not, not about the person. You know, don't, don't be speaking evil to that person, but uh, pray for them. And so, you know, first of all, Paul wants us to take a, a good look at our lives. You know, are we being a good example to the world, to the lost people around us? When they, when they look at us, do they see something that's different and appealing in a sense that they see Jesus in us. Now, you're always going to have some people that will hate you because you're Christians. I have, you've heard me talk about that. I had places where I worked. Guys would just take me out and beat me up because I'm a Christian. You know, you're always going to have that. But normally speaking, uh, around you, people, when they see you uh, doing good and loving people, that's going to affect them. Amen? It's going to affect them in a good way. Especially when you're loving those that are not loving you back. Uh, love your enemies. Do good to those Pray for those who spitefully use you and say all manner of evil against you. That's hard to do, and very hard to do. But that Jesus calls us to be different. He does. He calls us to be different than the world. Sometimes that's difficult. So he wants us to make sure that we're not acting like the world. And remember, we used to be like that. And if it wasn't for the grace of God, we would be right there. So we shouldn't get some big head thinking that we're better than them. And, and in some way, right? Uh, it, it, this should humble us and and cause us to have a burden for them, for the lost, to see them saved. And be kind, gentle. They use that word gentle <clears throat> with them. And kind to them, loving, showing the love of Jesus. So, you know, pray for me. Will you, will you pray for me? I'll pray for you that we will do that more. God will help us to do that more in our days to come, that we'll be able to control our emotions and act in such a way that's very pleasing to God and uh, have a great burden for the lost. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message, Father, from the Apostle Paul.